Okay, wonderful. So good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, this is our annual lecture of the Global Policy Institute. And uh, my name is Petra Minorop. I'm one of the co-directors of the Institute. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this meeting. This is a Zoom meeting. So this means we are all able to participate more actively. So you can ask your questions uh, independently after the lecture. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Stephanie uh, Walter, who joins us from uh, the University of Zurich. And uh, Stephanie Walter is a full professor of international relations and political economy at the Department of Political Science at the University of Zurich. And her research examines the distribution of conflict, political preferences, and economic policy outcomes related to globalization and financial crisis. And her current projects examine the backlash against globalization. And this is also the title of her lecture today. And Walter endorsed challenges to international institutions and the effects of Brexit on public opinion and politics in other countries. And she's the author of Financial Crisis and the Politics of Macroeconomic Adjustments, which was published a book in, in 2013 with Cambridge University Press. And she's a co-author of The Politics of Bad Options, Why the Eurozone's Problems Have Been So Difficult to Resolve. And this has been published just two years ago with Oxford University Press. Now, I'm absolutely delighted uh, that Professor Walter can join us here this afternoon. And as you know, the Global Policy Institute is a joint endeavor between um, the uh, um, Department of Law uh, at the Faculty of Health and Social Sciences and um, uh, SCIA, the School for uh, Government and International Relations. And so I'm delighted to have uh, an audience that is made up by lawyers, but also experts in international relations, uh, political theory. And I'm looking forward to the lecture and uh, to the discussion afterwards. And uh, Professor Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Petra, for this very kind introduction, and especially for the invitation to join you here for the annual lecture. Uh, it's really a pleasure, and I was very much looking forward to this. Um, let me share my screen. Um, uh, I will talk about the backlash against globalization, which is sort of an overview piece about what research against uh, about the backlash against globalization uh, looks like. It's, it's based on an annual review article that I wrote about this topic. Um, and I think it lays out nicely sort of the, the different kind of things that we can sort of think about when we look at, at this issue more broadly. Um, the motivation uh, to write this article is that we're seeing a backlash against globalization in a number of areas and against all three dimensions of globalization. Um, that's the political, um, uh, the, first of all, the economic dimension. Let's hear, the, the, for example, with the trade war between the US and China. Uh, we also see backlash against uh, political globalization, um, sort of more nationalist policies, backlash against international institutions and so on. But we also see backlash against social uh, globalization, for example, tourism protests uh, and, and these kind of things. Also, uh, protests against immigration more generally as sort of a social component of globalization. So um, I'm going to talk about sort of three, or I'm going to structure the talk in three main sections. The first one is, what is the globalization backlash? Um, what, what did it? Okay. <laughs> What what uh, sort of what what do, what do we we mean by it uh, conceptually? Um, the second one is um, talking about the causes of the backlash against globalization. Where does it come from? And then in the third part, I'm going to talk about the consequences, possible dynamics that we're seeing, and the dynamics they're um, they're creating. So let's start with the question: What are we actually talking about? What is the globalization backlash? Um, I define it broadly as, um, as a significant decrease in public partisan or policy support for globalization, right? So that includes backlash, both with regard to the, the three different dimensions of globalization, economic, political, and the social cultural uh, globalization dimensions, and also backlash with regard to different relevant groups of actors, voters, political intermediaries, and governments. 
So it's a very broad um, definition of the globalization backlash. Now, a dominant narrative that we've heard a lot, especially in the media in the last couple of years, it is uh, that the losers of globalization are lashing out against globalization in its different forms. So that what we're seeing is a popular backlash against globalization rooted in changing preferences of the mass public. Right? Uh, and that implies uh, that, we, that what is underlying the globalization backlash is a major shift in public opinion directed against trade, international cooperation, immigration, and so on, right? different forms of globalization. But actually, when we look at the data, and there's not that much data out there that looks or, or tracks public opinion on globalization related issues for long periods of time. This data here is from the International Social Survey Project, which is one of the few that, that actually provides the same questions for the same countries over a longer period of time, in this case, 1995 to 2013. Uh, and what we can actually see here is that these preferences are remarkably stable. And they also don't, even when there are changes, they don't uniformly point uh, in the direction of growing opposition to globalization. But in some cases, actually support for globalization goes up in other support for globalization goes down. But overall, what we can see is a, a remarkable stability in opinions regarding globalization. So we don't really see a backlash in public opinion. But what we do see, and what I think is really driving this backlash, is a politicization of globalization-related issues. So even though the preferences on globalization issues are stable, relatively stable, uh, the mass public has become increasingly aware of and also more polarized about issues uh, regarding um, uh, surrounding globalization. Right? So the contestation about these issues has become much more prominent in recent years, and that has led to a new cleavage between globalization winners and losers in a much more prominent place in the public debate. What this also means is that opposition to globalization was always there. What you can see here is that there have always been people who didn't like globalization, who didn't think that trade was a good idea, who didn't think that immigration was a good idea, and so on, right? But they were relatively silent, but now, their opposition, this pre-existing opposition has been much more effectively mobilized, right? So globalization skeptics have become much more visible and also more politically consequential, right? Even if their number remains stable, the issue has become more prominent and that makes them politically influential. And that overall, all of these developments together have led to a politicization of globalization, right? So it's not really an underlying change in opinion, but a change essentially in the salience uh, in the public debate. Uh, but that has actual consequences, and we can see that in political behavior, right? So on the one hand, we see increasing civil society mobilization against globalization. That's not a completely new phenomenon. Think of the, uh, the, the uh, Seattle or Genova uh, protests against international institutions that were already happened in the 1990s. Um, but it's also apparent in voting behavior, both in terms of voting for anti-globalization parties and anti-globalization candidates, nationalist parties and candidates, and for proposals that are directed against globalization. Right? So what you can see here is the average vote shares of Euroskeptic parties for the European countries or right-wing parties, nationalist parties, uh, over uh, the last um, six decades uh, from the 1950s until the 2010s. Um, or even seven decades, I don't know, I have to count seven, yes. Yeah. Um, and you, what you can see is a, is, a, uh, is a really clear trend towards higher vote shares overall, right? So we see that uh, the, the electoral success of these, uh, of these parties has grown over time. What we can also see that when we look at foreign policy referendums, so that's referend national referendums on foreign policy related issues, we see that on both voters are called to increasingly vote on proposals that are about leaving international institutions or not cooperating anymore on international um, uh, or not complying with international um, treaties and agreements and, and international organizations. So, I mean, here, for example, one of these is obviously Brexit, the Brexit referendum. But you can see it's by far the, not the only one, right? So there are others as well. Switzerland has had a few, a few for example, themselves. It's not completely new. We had this before um, uh, in the 1970s, the first UK referendum in the 1980s, for example, the um, 
uh, uh, Spain voted on remaining in NATO and so on. But what we can really see is that the share of these kinds of proposals has really increased in the last decade. We can also see a shift towards non-cooperative votes, both with regard to uh, uh, like, uh, like voting against new forms of cooperation or voting in favor of leaving existing forms of cooperation. Um, and this is what you can see here. The votes against international cooperation, the vote share has really increased over time. And now in the last decade, it was almost half of the, or actually half of the referendums that, had, uh, that were voting on international cooperation were referendums where international cooperation was rejected at the ballot box. So what we can really see is that sort of these kind of non-cooperative uh, votes have really increased. What we can also see is a backlash by political entrepreneurs. Now we're shifting gears from voters um, to political entrepreneurs, especially political parties. And that's related to the emergence of the second axis of party composition, competition, where in addition to the traditional left-right um, party competition, we now have a second axis, and the, people call it different, the cultural axis, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the tan, um, um, tan gal axis and so on. People call it differently, but essentially it's a non-left-right, but it's sort of the second dimension um, where people also often, like the parties compete on issues such as nationalism, um, European politics and so on. And this emergence of a second axis of party competition has created new opportunities for political parties to successfully challenge established parties. Uh, and they do that by emphasizing issues such as immigration, national sovereignty, European integration and so on as core components. And that makes it, those are all issues where the, where the mainstream parties oftentimes have sort of not such clear um, policies, but they, are also, they have a much broader set of opinions that they host. And sort of these political entrepreneurs sort of eat away at, at these mainstream parties um, vote shares by strategically um, positioning uh, themselves in this, in this two-dimensional new space, right? Um, so that makes them successful. We saw uh, in, in one of the slides how their vote share has gone up. Uh, and we can also see this um, in the fact that globalization skeptic parties and politicians increasingly even participate in government. They're not just in parliament, they, but they actually make it into government. Um, we can see this, for example, by looking at partisan discourse. Um, this is data based on uh, the manifesto project. So it looks at what um, parties say in election campaigns, in their, in their election manifestos. Um, and it counts the percentage of statements in these party programs that um, talk positively about um, globalization. Those are these uh, gray dots here, or that talk negatively about globalization. So it's about positive things about trade, immigration, international organizations, and so on, or negative things about these kind of things, right? Or an endorsement of protectionism and so on. And what you can see is that almost over most of the time in the past decades, the positive statements significantly outweighed negative statements, right? But in recent years, the share of negative statements not only has increased significantly, but it's now also uh, on with the same amount as positive statements, right? So it's no longer the case that there's more positive statements in partisan discourse. And this is partisan discourse by all parties, not just your skeptic right-wing nationalist parties, but this is all parties. Um, positive and uh, negative uh, statements about globalization in the last decades have canceled each other out. Right? So th there's really a change in partisan discourse. It's become much more critical of globalization. What does this then mean when we look at outcomes and what globalization actually looks like? Um, here are graphs about the Euro globalization. So these are actually treaties uh, that look at uh, that, that, and then treaties and international organizations and so on, different measures of globalization in the economic and the political and in the social realm. This is uh, data based on the COF uh, globalization index. Uh, and it looks at different types of countries, high income countries, the blue is upper middle income countries, then the red is lower middle income countries and low income countries. And what you can see in most of these uh, graphs and for all of these dimensions is sort of like a S 
shaped curve with a real acceleration in um, in globalization in the 1990s. I don't know why my, my computer is doing this. Okay, wait here. Um, I have a new computer, I apologize. It's still doing things that it's not supposed to do. Um, we see an acceleration in globalization in most countries uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s. And then we see a leveling off uh, in the 2000s, 2010s, especially the 2010s, so it has this S shape. What we don't see is a real reduction in globalization, or at least we don't see it yet in the data, who knows? Um, so what we really see when it comes to de facto policies, the, the, the actual, like the, the outcome, the globalization on the ground, we see a slowdown rather than a real backlash and a going down in globalization related policies. Right? And the, the, the picture looks quite similar when we look at de facto globalization, not just the Euro globalization. Um, oh, this is the de facto globalization. So de facto globalization stagnates as well. Right? So we see a stagnation at a relatively high level, right? but it's no longer increasing as it long did for a long period of time. In some areas, we're also seeing backlash. This is a graph of international investment agreements that were newly um, uh, uh, entering into force. Those are the gray uh, lines. And then in black, it's terminated agreements. And what you can see is that in the last years, uh, the number of term, there were actually more international investment agreements that were terminated than newly signed, right? So here we actually see some areas where, where we increasingly see countries getting out of these agreements, sort of getting out of these types of political globalization. So to summarize, what we can observe is backlash across, across all three dimensions of globalization, the, the, the economic, the political, and the socio-cultural. At the same time, we also see that um, it's more a politicization of existing opposition rather than the emergence of new opposition. In the, in the party political realms, it's a bit, it's, it's, there we actually see new parties really gaining traction. But in terms of public opinion, we don't really see a big shift in public opinion. What we see is really that existing opposition has been politicized and now suddenly plays a bigger role. Um, and in terms of outcomes, um, we mostly see no reduction, but a slowdown of growth and a leveling off. But there are three new trends. So, so, so this sort of suggests it's not, not that much new, right? It's, I mean, there are some changes, especially politically it matters, but it's nothing sort of profound. But there are three new trends that I think we, you know, we may in for a rougher ride or more change in the future. The first one is that what we see now, what we did not see before is a growing backlash against major international organizations. Um, sort of exits from international organizations, also criticism, that's nothing new. The uh, International Whaling Organization has seen exits, the International Tourism Organization has seen many uh, exits and so on. But now increasingly what we see is that major international institutions come under pressure. Uh, institutions and organizations like the WTO, the EU, NATO, the International Criminal Court, or also the, the Paris Climate Agreement, right? And that's interesting and to some extent um, uh, maybe more consequential than some of the other exits that we've seen because these are core institutions that underpin the architecture of the contemporary world order, right? And that world order allowed globalization to emerge in the first place. So the question is if these institutions really get significantly weakened, what does it then do to the international architecture more generally? So the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, for example, is a really successful. Um, uh, or was a really successful um, international um, uh, mechanism to resolve international disputes about trade that has been blocked by the US, right? And, and that's, that's really a significant weakening of, of WTO. So that's the first trend. The second one is that we see particularly strong backlash in some countries that we always sort of understood to be sort of main pillars of the global order, in particular the US and the UK, right? Uh, so uh, those are really the, 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 the core pillars of the liberal world order. But what you can see here, if you look at sort of US exits from international organizations and agreements, it's not like the US has never withdrawn. They, uh, they have in fact uh, done that quite a few times, but as we all know, this really accelerated in the Trump years in the US. 
So uh, that's that's uh, worrisome. It's the US, the UK, but we also see a lot of opposition in some other uh, Western countries. And these are sort of central nodes in the global economic networks with potential to also weaponize interdependence, right? So that's, that's a, a trend that people are watching carefully. Um, and the question is a little bit, what does this then mean systemically for the contemporary world order at large, right? And that also feeds into the third point is that in the most recent years, the risks associated with globalization and the interdependence it creates has be, have become much more visible than they used to be. Right? So both the pandemic and the Ukraine crisis have demonstrated just how interconnected the world is and also how this creates vulnerabilities. I mean, the, the pandemic seriously disrupted uh, supply chains. We're still struggling uh, with, um, with getting them back in order. Um, I recently tried to order a, <laughs> something from Ikea and, and they said, well, we actually don't know when this is gonna arrive because you know they're, we're waiting for a shipment from China and we don't really know when we can get a container. That never used to be a problem. All of a sudden it's a problem. And um, so we see these supply chain interactions and the, the interconnection and how vulnerable we are is of course driven home nowadays, these days uh, as well with the sanctions and especially also the I mean, we have the official sanctions, but then we also have all these uh, activities by private actors, such as Visa and MasterCard, who just now decided not to service any clients in Russia anymore. Uh, I read that about three quarters of all um, uh, non-cash transactions, like the, the, the card transactions in Russia are uh, run by Visa and MasterCard. So you can imagine what the disruption that actually means, right? So it becomes very clear how vulnerable we are to these international firms, to these international interactions, right? So um, there's a really interesting literature um, um, and a paper by uh, um, Abe Newman and Henry Farrell on uh, weaponized interdependence and how easy it is to use these kind of interdependencies to also really gain leverage over other countries. And I think the current crisis really demonstrates that. And I think one of the interesting questions uh, or issues to look for in the coming months and years will be to see how countries react to that, or also political entrepreneurs, political actors more generally, what will be the response of China, for example, um, of, of, but other countries as well. Once, once it's demonstrated how easily a country can also be cut off, will they react and how will they react? Right? So that it's, 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 I would say at this point, it's unclear on uh, how this will affect globalization going forward, but I imagine there will be some effects and I think it will be important to study what it actually does. Okay, so we've looked at what the globalization backlash actually is. Uh, so next is of course the question, where does it come from? What are the causes of the globalization backlash? Um, and sort of one prominent um, explanation, especially in IPE in international political economy is that it's related to structural transformations, right? So that, um, that globalization and the other major structural transformations that we've seen in the last decade, deindustrialization, automation, digitalization, and so on, that they, or also these big immigration waves sometimes that we've seen, that they have facilitated the backlash. There is a considerable debate, however, on whether globalization itself is the main driver of the globalization backlash. Right? So on the one hand, especially on the regional and local level, we have a host of studies that shows that um, globalization related regional developments are associated with backlash against globalization. So there's a big literature on the China shock, for example. What this shows is that, for example, um, in, uh, in areas, where competition from China has significantly grown, they tend to vote more strongly for nationalist parties. They voted more, they were more likely to vote for Brexit, for example, also more likely to vote for Trump and so on, right? So in that sense, that's actually quite similar to the globalization backlash that we saw in the late 19th and early 20th century. I think that's an interesting uh, parallel here. Um, and uh, at that time, the backlash that we saw was mostly driven by structural transformations, such as the integration of um, commodity markets and mass migration. But also we see that sort of globalization itself created opposition, right? On the other hand, once we go really to the micro level and look at voting behavior and these kind of things, what we see is that other socioeconomic transformations are equally important or even more important in driving these um, 
these developments and areas that are hit by you know competition from china also tend to be areas that have less competitive um, um, firms and then the structure like they, they tend to have other structural problems as well so it's not so clear that it's really globalization itself or whether it's just declining regions where uh, opposition to globalization is um, growing particularly strongly so we also see other economic transformations that tend to also correlate with globalization shocks, deindustrialization, technological change, rising inequality, and so on. And of course, there's also many non-economic transformations that we've seen that have had very consequential effects, such as the end of the Cold War, rising immigration levels, cultural value change, also the increasing reach of international organizations into domestic politics. International organizations today um, have much more say of our daily lives than, than they used to have, especially big organizations, for example, like the, like the EU or the WTO that really have impact on, on, on day to day business and so on. So that, that's one debate. Is it globalization or some other structural transformation? The second big trend, uh, debate is about material versus non-material causes of the backlash. That's a huge debate. Um, and the evidence is mixed. Uh, there's evidence that uh, exposure to the risk of globalization, be trade, migration, offshoring, and so on, leads to um, more opposition to globalization. But then there's also big literature that shows that cultural concerns, identity, ideology, concerns about sovereignty and so on are equally or even more important than these material causes. Um, and um, I mean, that, that's a huge literature. There's also lots of reviews on this. If you're interested in it, I, I actually think this juxtaposition, is it material or non-material is not very fruitful. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, there are some methodolo methodological issues on why it's easier to measure, especially on the individual level, um, non-material causes, it's, you can ask people about their values, it's much harder to really gauge people's objective, you know, uh, material risks and so on. Um, and I think, I mean, if, if, if in my reading, what the literature really shows and drives home is that both material and non-material causes matter, it's not one or the other, it's both. And that's why I think it's much more fruitful to think about um, how these two causes interact, how they're interrelated, um, uh, and to, under which circumstances and for whom, you know, material causes matter more, for whom non-material causes matter, matter more, and also how material and non-material um, causes, um, for example, um, strengthen each other and so on. So I think questions that will be really important and interesting to study going forward is, are, for example, how are economic developments linked with the emergence of non-material concerns? How does opposition against different dimensions of globalization reinforce or undermine each other? For example, how is opposition to immigration related to opposition against trade? Um, what's the role of expectations about what the less globalized counterfactual world would look like? and what the consequences of protectionist, isolationist, or nationalist policies would be. When and how uh, do uh, pro previously low salience issues related to globalization turn into a major and consequential globalization backlash? Or how do responses to the globalization backlash reinforce or mitigate these causes? And so I think those are really interesting questions going forward. And I think that the literature needs to evolve and I think it is, has started also to evolve in, the, evolve in this direction away from the is it material or non-material to really study this interaction which is really like a fascinating field. Okay so um, leaving aside the causes I think the really interesting question is what does the globalization backlash actually do? What are the consequences? Um, and I think it's useful to think about these questions um, uh, um, by focusing on two dimensions. The first one is the locus of action and the second one is the type of response. So the locus of action is what, what are we actually focusing on, on the societal level, voters, civil society, organizations, firms, political parties, and so on. We could also focus on the national level. So that's basically the domestic policy response. And we can focus on the international level for example, government behavior in international negotiations or responses by international organizations. Right? So those are three, um, the three levels uh, of the first dimension. And then the second dimension that I think is useful to just order our thinking about the consequences is the type of response. And I think we can, we can 
distinguish between responses that yield to and reinforce the backlash and responses that mitigate and push back against the globalization backlash, right? So if you want to sort of lay out this, this basically gives a three by two table um, where we can look at the reinforcing uh, consequences on these three levels uh, of analysis and the pushback against the backlash on three levels of analysis. Reinforcing dynamics means that responses um, uh, to the globalization backlash um, reinforce the underlying grievances and sort of can create self-perpetuating dynamics. And what you can see here on, in this graph is, you've probably seen this before, is the so-called Kindleberger spiral. It's um, a graph that Charles Kindleberger did about the Great Depression, and it looks at world trade, the, the, the world trade volume uh, during the, um, the, world, uh, the, the, the Great Depression in the US. What the US did in, in the Great Depression was uh, introduce serious uh, tariffs, the smooth early uh, tariffs, in an effort to sort of get more, like limit imports and uh, generate more exports. But what actually happened was that there was retaliatory action by other countries. So what happened over time was that the volume of world trade, so the, basically here it's the further out in the spiral you are, the bigger is world trade over two years really declined overall. So what happened was that it really spiraled out of control and countries just didn't trade anymore. It didn't reach to just the same amount of trade, but the US got more of it, but it just like reduced trade overall. Right? So that's a reinforcing dynamic. That it was an action that was done in response to a problem, but it actually led to a deterioration and an increase in the problem. So at the societal level, um, we can look at two examples, for example, voters and parties. Um, what we can see here is that successful globalization backlash, for example, big mobilization or electoral successes of globalization skeptic parties or policy backlash, that can intensify voters' anti-globalization attitudes and preferences. Right? So what you can see here, for example, is, um, is um, based on some research that I've done on the effects of Brexit uh, on public opinion in other countries. This is here um, the effect on the... Uh, uh, on Germany and France, that's the dotted line, um, and all other EU 27 countries. And here, what we've asked people is to, um, to say uh, what, uh, what they think how Brexit will affect the UK in the medium term in the next five years. And then um, on the dependent variable, we asked them, um, or I asked them, I, I, I designed this, um, whether they would support an e a withdrawal of their own country from the EU. And not surprisingly, I mean, this is of course just correlational and so on, but you see a very clear relationship that those who think that Brexit is going well for the UK um, uh, also are much more likely to support an exit of their own country from the EU. And those who think that Brexit is actually not going so well for the UK also think that their country shouldn't necessarily leave the EU, right? So we see that sort of there's also reverberations of these effects in one country to the other, right? Um, what we also see is there's quite some research that shows that when um, nationalists or radical right parties are successful, that mainstream parties then often sh shift their policy positions in a more globalization skeptic or anti-immigrant or protectionist direction. Right? So that also increases the backlash. So you have backlash in the form of um, uh, nationalist or right, radical right parties. They're successfully and that they're successful. And in response, the whole party spectrum also shifts in a more skeptical direction, right? So again, that's a reinforcing dynamic. On the domestic policy level, we can also have a reinforcing dynamics um, when, the, uh, when the implementation of protectionist, isolationist, anti-immigrant and so on policies deepens policy-based globalization backlash, right? So we saw before and what, what globalization outcome, like actual globalization looks like, when there are policies that increase new tariffs, for example, or limit um, um, freedom of movement and so on, that of course then leads to less, a less globalized world overall, right? The interesting thing is that often these policies are designed to alleviate globalization related problems. Like we have, you know, an immigration uh, push. So we try to, to stop immigration, but that can actually backfire because it can politicize the issue further. 
it can lead to retaliation of other countries. Think about the tariffs and the Kindle broker spiral that I just showed you. So you increase tariffs and the other countries uh, increase tariffs uh, in response. Uh, it can also erode the confidence in the compliance with international agreements, and that might encourage other countries not to comply as well. And it can undermine and dismantle existing institutional structures without replacing these institutions with functioning alternatives. Right? So, I mean, we see, in, for example, with, with Brexit, uh, now the UK is out, but now you need to actually replace all these free trade agreements with new trade agreements. That takes time. It's quite, quite, uh, quite costly in terms of sort of transaction costs and so on. The question is also whether other countries, for example, China, could move in to fill the void, uh, but that might actually further aggravate uh, certain grievances. Right. So then again, giving rise to this reinforcing dynamic. And finally, on the international level, uh, what we can see is that a higher responsiveness to voters at home often reduces the willingness of governments to compromise in international negotiations on the international level. So countries or governments that, uh, that have um, rather skeptical um, uh, populations at home, we know from studies, for example, in the European Council, tend to be less willing to make um, compromises and so on. And to the extent that international cooperation just requires compromise. I mean, that's the essence of, of cooperation in the end. That can also um, be um, problematic. What we can also observe is self-restricting behavior by international organizations. So for example, we see that especially in areas where uh, there's lots of public opposition, for example, for the European Court of Justice, there's research that shows that the ECJ has become more restrictive in its ruling, more careful because it knows that it's so contested what it does. The EU Commission has been shown to withdraw policy proposals when there's lots of opposition, when, when it's in areas where there's lots of um, um, uh, opposition among the vast public, for example. Right? This can also reinforce the backlash dynamics because it complicates decision-making on the international level. So in terms, in, in terms of how effective international cooperation is, um, sort of, or in terms of output legitimacy, this, this can create a problem because it reduces the ability to address transnational problems. And this can also reduce the legitimacy of international institutions. Right? So there's, there's some uh, dynamics that this creates that may actually then reinforce the problem. But there's also um, sort of this other, uh, the second column, which looks at the pushback against the globalization backlash. Not all responses lead to more backlash, but there's also quite a lot of responses that push back. So uh, one of the things that we see is that large groups of people and political parties remain supportive of globalization, and they have also become more vocal in recent years. It just used to be not an issue that we talk so much about, but suddenly you see pro-Europe uh, demonstrations, which is something that we hadn't really seen before, right? Um, we also see that there's considerable resistance against the globalization backlash. Um, and really support for international cooperation in some areas, such as here, for example, uh, climate cooperation. So on the societal level, what we see is that uh, there are quite a, a, a lot of vocal civil society organizations that have emerged that counter mobilize um, in favor of international cooperation that are against uh, xenophobic statements, policies, and so on. And often they are for uh, more progressive values more generally. Right? So that's on the, on the citizen level. Um, with regards to parties, we see increasingly parties that vocally support cosmopolitan and international stances and emphasize their opposition to nationalist stances. I mean, I have the picture here of Emmanuel Macron, who uh, in the last presidential election really made, made a point of saying, I am for Europe, right? Also setting sort of himself up against um, uh, Marine Le Pen and, and sort of really making the statement, not sort of just hiding this in the program, or I'm also for Europe, but really making this one of the central pillars of his campaign of saying, I am for Europe, for a strong Europe, and so on. That's also a relatively new development. What I find particularly puzzling and where I think we need a much more research on is why businesses, especially export-oriented businesses, and those who are really firmly embedded in global value chains, have not more vocally opposed backlash policies. I mean, for me, for example, with Brexit, one of the big puzzles is why there has not been more pushback from, from British business, also British finance, the same in the US with Trump and so on. And um, I mean, Trump, of course, got firms also a big tax break and so on. But it's really, I find it fascinating because I think the prior from IPE research would have been 
that these firms will sort of really not just give up these gains from globalization, but in fact, they have not really stood in the way. And I think it's really an interesting question why that is. On the domestic policy uh, level, we also see pushback. Um, I'm gonna talk especially about um, one that has received a lot of attention also in research, which is sort of this idea of compensation for globalization losers. And sort of the, the idea is sort of, um, I mean, there's this, this famous piece by, by Ruggie on, on sort of embedded liberalism. And the idea is now we need to re-embed liberalism. We need to compensate the losers of globalization for the problems they're facing and making them more willing to embrace the benefits of globalization because they do not have to carry the downsides of globalization by themselves alone. That strategy faces a few challenges. Um, first is that globalization winners, and perhaps the biggest one, the globalization winners are often unwilling to share their gains from globalization. I mean, efforts to increase taxes on high income uh, people or you know, firms and so on uh, to sort of then broaden the welfare state, is, it's not that easy, let's put it this way. There's quite a lot of opposition to do that. Um, the government's room to compensate is also constrained, especially in a globalized world with a lot of tax competition. If you want to have, if you want to really redistribute a lot, you also need to tax. But then, uh, you know, companies might just move elsewhere. in In a world that's open and where where finance and capital is, is mobile. And then it's also an interesting question: how effective that a compensation strategy really is, because what we see is that the globalization backlash has not been limited to countries without a strong welfare state. So this argument, we just need to, to strengthen welfare and compensate the losers, I think is particularly strong in the US, um, sometimes also in the UK, but particularly in the US where people say, if we only had a, a welfare state, then all of this would not be happening. But we actually also see a globalization backlash in Sweden, in Finland, in Denmark. I, I mean, it's not that these countries don't have a well-developed uh, welfare state. What I think is interesting is that the backlash against economic globalization seems more mooted in these countries. It comes more in the form of backlash against political and or cultural uh, globalization. So the question is, what does compensation do? Does it shift the type of the opposition to the type of globalization or does it actually mute compensation? So it's, it's actually, that's a fascinating, I think, area of research where, where there's quite a lot of open questions. And finally, we can have pushback on the international level. So a government's pushback against attempts by individual countries to extract better terms of cooperation at the international level, it sounds complicated, but think of the EU27 pushing back against uh, the UK in the Brexit negotiations and saying, or also for that matter, Switzerland in its uh, relations with um, the UK and sort of saying, look, I mean, you cannot, you cannot just have better terms and get a bigger share of the pie and we take less. So, but there's actually a pushback against that. Uh, governments also create workarounds to uphold cooperation when it's really threatened. Um, I, I talked briefly about the WTO dispute settlement uh, system before that is um, completely paralyzed now because of US opposition. But um, other countries have created a workaround and basically have created sort of a copycat of the existing um, WTO rules and sort of that, that's, but it's outside of WTO system. And all countries that participate in that have basically agreed to participate in that and sort of copying this without sort of the US veto. It's not as ideal if it, as if it's in the um, WTO system. It's, it's how effective it is will remains to be seen. But there's at least sort of some creativity in trying to sort of if, if let the institutions evolve when, we, when, when there is sort of globalization backlash on this level. We also see responses by international organizations. Um, there's lots of research that shows that IOs have worked to enhance the legit legitimacy, for example, by changing their communication patterns. The European Central Bank, for example, has become much more active. They have a Twitter account now. They have much more, they explain what they do much more in order to increase their legitimacy or the legitimacy of their uh, decisions. Um, we see quite a lot of international organizations that have established parliamentary bodies to sort of increase the democratic legitimacy of their decisions. It's also not, not always so easy. It's also um, associated with some trade-offs and so on. Uh, and more generally, we have seen IOs who really try to improve their procedural standards and performance quality. The International Monetary Fund, for example, after it was criticized so harshly after the Asian financial crisis, 
implemented in, in, in a sort of an independent evaluation body that sort of evaluates IMF programs and so on. So I also have also responded in a way to sort of counter the globalization backlash and the criticism and sort of increasing their, their legitimacy. As well. All right, so to conclude, uh, what is the globalization backlash? Um, it's not associated with a large swing in public opinion against globalization. It's more the politicization of opposition, of also pre-existing opposition to globalization. Um, but the increasing influence of globalization skeptic actors is real and has resulted in more protectionist, isolationist and nationalist policies, some of which also fundamentally threaten core pillars of the contemporary international order. So think of WTO, um, also Trump's ideas to withdraw from NATO. I mean, I think we're all grateful right now that the US has not withdrawn from NATO, um, but you can imagine what it would like had Trump won a second term. And maybe that's also what Putin was waiting for, who knows, right? I mean, th these are, I think, really interesting questions. Uh, in terms of the causes of the backlash against globalization, um, we've seen that both material and non-material causes drive the globalization backlash. And it, the interesting question is how these causes coexist, how they interact and how they mediate each other. And finally, in terms of the consequences of the globalization backlash, we see that they are shaped by the responses of societal actors of national governments and international policymakers. These responses can either yield to and then reinforce, or they can push back against the globalization backlash and strengthen um, the global architecture. Um, and understanding the dynamics that this produces will be, in my opinion, an important task for future research. That's it um, for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward um, to your questions and the discussion. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was very comprehensive, thought-provoking, uh, absolutely insightful uh, talk. And uh, thank you again very much for, for doing this for us. Um, so I've got uh, actually three questions, but I'm very happy to rest them and give everyone else uh, uh, the chance to, to ask the question first. But if there's, yeah, Kiriaki, I see your hand up already, please. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Stephanie. And that was really, really interesting. And something that came to mind, like I think you put the globalization backlash is against international cooperation. But do you think perhaps it's what international cooperation has been synonymous to, which has been about trade and this neoliberal, you know, a world order and so on, rather than perhaps more cooperation in areas like environmental protection, you know, uh, combating climate change. We have lots of colleagues in, um, in the Institute that work on, on environmental governance, for example. So is the backlash, you think, equally, I don't know, the same? Because I know there's a lot of support, for example, in my view, for, you know, international cooperation to combat uh, climate change, but perhaps the backlash is more on the, on the trade side and on the neoliberal side. Uh, so I wanted just your take on this, if it's all the same, basically. Uh, Peter, do you want me to answer uh, to each question or do you want to collect? No, if you want to answer now, I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, Kyriaki, thank you. thank you very much for that question. Um, I mean, I, I think there's lots of variation um, there uh, on the types of issues. Uh, I think sort of trade and so on, I would put under the banner of economic globalization, um, opposition to international cooperation institutions and so on, I would put under the banner of political globalization. But within these categories, there's also lots of variation in backlash, right? And I think it's, for example, interesting that, uh, and there you also see the differences. For example, if you look at the climate youth who absolutely want international cooperation on the, um, on the, on, the, on the climate and environmental front, but are of course at the same time very critical of the economic dimension, right? So this also, I mean, you can be critical on one dimension but support another dimension. And I think those are interesting questions. And I think your question also raised an interesting question of, you know, A, is there one that's more? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the immigration backlash is really strong. So that's the sociocultural. Um, within the political, there's also lots of variation. I mean, the EU has been, been criticized a lot, but there's also some support. Um, it also depends on the different levels, right? WTO, I think, has had much more serious problems with, with Trump and the dispute settlement system, but it was not so politicized as, say, the EU um, 
Uh, and then with trade, um, I think trade is still standing relatively um, safe, except for this dispute settlement thing. But with investment treaties, we actually see a lot of pushback with countries pulling out of that and also sort of TTIP and, and the whole investment. I mean, that has become also a civil society issue. So I think that's actually a really interesting question for research. What explains variation in, in, in this? There is some research on sort of also the authority of international organizations and how that's linked to opposition, right? That the IOs that have more authority tend to inspire more protest and so on. So there, there is some research out there. Thank you very much. And I see Robert's hand up and there's also someone in the chat. So if you want to come in with your question or if not, I will read out your question in the chat after Robert's. Um, thanks, uh, Peter. It might make sense, even though I think Benoha Shad was earlier, but maybe have this follow up question because I think it, it nicely continues with um, Kiriaki. Thank you so much, um, Stephanie. I also really, truly enjoyed this. This was a wonderful, compact overview, really well-structured, um, very enjoyable. My question is similar in terms of variation. And I wondered what you felt about the global South. And the reason is that I, I wondered if many of the conclusions and many of the diagnostics that you made are really in relation to the global North. In a sense, it might be for structural reasons, it might be for other reasons, but I wondered if you would say that mutandus mutandus, you would also be able to have these conclusions for some of the global south. So very similar, I think, to, to mm -hmm. Kiriaki and disaggregating um, the regions here instead of maybe the, the dimensions of economic, political and social. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an interesting. It's a super interesting and important question. And I think it, it also shows sort of one of the, the, I think, problems of this literature is that it's predominantly focused on sort of the OECD world or even perhaps even really just Europe and Northern America, right? I mean, Canada and, and the US. Uh, and I think, uh, I think expanding that to the global South is really important. There is some research that looks at it. And I think especially sort of on the level of international organizations, there is quite some research, for example, how the rise of China, for example, and the dissatisfaction with China for example, with regard to its voting rights in the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, how, how they come in. And I think that's actually an important component sort of on, on that sort of higher level that we need to uh, look into. Um, I think with regard to um, public opinion, part of the, the, the problem is that there is a limitation in terms of data, but it's actually, I mean, we have increasing data also from, from developing countries, right, where we can, um, where we could draw on and look at, at this in much more detail. And I think that's really something that the literature needs to do. My sense from the literature, I mean, I have some work also on developing countries. It's the sort of this politicization of globalization backlash or, or dissatisfaction with globalization, that that's not as extensive in the developing world as mm. it is in the North. But that's really, that's more sort of a gut feeling that I have from the literature. I haven't looked into this uh, more generally, but, um, and then again, it's not really completely true. If you look at Bolsonaro, for example, in, um, uh, in Brazil, or if you look also at Venezuela and the sort of the criticism of the whole mm. global uh, economy. So then actually, yeah, I mean, also, you know, um, the Philippines, pulling out of the ICC, many African countries being very critical of the ICC. So again, that's the, that's the political dimension. I think we need to study much more and, and in a much more integral part, sort mm. of what is, what also, if there is, is there variation? And if so, what, what explains that variation? When is there variation? When is there not? What are the groups? Are like the, the globalization skeptic groups that, that mobilize in the North, similar to the ones in the South? I think those are really uh, important questions. And I'm afraid that I cannot give you the full answer, but I- I don't have any answer either. I but I, I, what I wanna say is that I think those are really important uh, questions. And I also think that if we want to sort of think about this in that in the sort of, how do you wanna uphold globalization and the world globalist in this? I think we cannot just focus on this little part that has sort of been driving this, but we really mm. need to take this bigger picture into account. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you very much. I will just read out what's in the chat because um, Benoit Chavat just said I can't speak, but uh, I can read it out. So the question is, how can you explain that there is a rise of political votes if the public opinion is not particularly against globalization? But yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, um, I think opposition to globalization was always there. The, I mean, also, if you look at old studies from the from the 1980s and so on, you always people always look at sort of why do people like trade and there's variations, some like it and some dislike. it. Right? So there were always people uh, who, who disliked it. But when it comes to how like what drives your political behavior, I mean, you get to cast one vote, right? And then you need to decide what what is important to you. I mean, you have like a range of political parties and you know, even though perhaps you don't like trade, but this party still, you know, offers a better pension reform or something that you like, perhaps that's more important for you. And then you just vote on that. And for a long time, really, that left right dimension was like the key thing. And it, there was not a lot of politicization of the issue. And people just, I mean, they maybe disliked it, but they didn't really have a political party or something that really mobilized on this issue. And, and that's what I mean with politicization. I don't think it has, there has been a big shift. It's not really the case that sort of the group that opposes globalization has really grown, but they have found a way to express this existing opposition much more because there are political entrepreneurs and political structures have changed in a way with the two dimensional party space that make it much, much easier to express these grievances. So it, it basically, it means that existing opposition has become mobilized. And over time, this translates then into, uh, 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 into more votes against globalization because these people now can, can actually vote against it. So, so that's how it seems paradox, right? Why is there no change, but we actually see change. But I think it's really to do, has really a lot to do with the politicization and mobilization of existing opposition. Thank you very much. I don't see any hands at the moment, so maybe I can ask my questions. That's okay. Uh, can I ask three, two, I'm quite short, and then the last one it links with the second, perhaps, to some extent. So one is just a clarification. I didn't quite understand um, the, the definition for DU globalization, how you define that. Um, that was on the in the first uh, third of uh, the slides. Um, the, the, the definition for what? Uh, de jure. Ah, the jure. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, and then I was wondering. So it, the second question is, um, what is the rule? What is the role of law in globalization? Is it to measure how much globalization we have, or is it to predict where we will see a backlash or more globalization? And um, I mean, just to give you one example, I think at COP twenty six we've seen some failures in key areas, but some progress. And at the same time, even though we haven't fulfilled the Paris Agreement goals and are not even on track on doing that, we still see 173 states agreeing to develop a new treaty regime on plastics in two years time. So um, we still see the commitment to create new law. Um, what does that mean in, in terms of is that you know towards more globalization or less and would be really interesting how you see that from, from that side this law how that comes in and then my, my third question is um i mean there's always this kind of blaming the the international law or the inter institutions that um do too much and regulate and um are to blame for, for, for these kind of backlashes and reactions. And, and we've seen that in the Brexit dis discussion, uh, certainly. But I'm wondering whether it's not sometimes constitutional law that we should look at and, and say, well, the constitutional system in many states is not or no longer fit for purpose to ensure the participation that should be there if we make law at this level. For example, if we have uh, the executive making law agreeing to legally binding decisions at these meetings of parties, but these decisions will never enter any negotiations in any parliament. They will never form part of a protocol of a treaty regime, but yet they will be implemented and they will affect everyone's lives. So, uh, but that's not something that the international, at the international legal um, level, this is all in good shape and order, but it's just the national, the, the, the national participation process is almost not there that could keep up with these developments of lawmaking approaches that we see. So I was just wondering how much 
it does that play a role in in terms of creating this backlash perhaps yeah, those, those are a fascinating question. Thanks a lot. Let me start with the clarification. Um, so at the, the COF, which is a um, sort of a research institute at ETH in Zurich, they have created a big index of globalization. And they, they have two sets. One is the de facto uh, set and one is the de jure set. And the de jure measure is essentially laws, um, treaties and so on. So uh, if you want, for example, in the, in the field of trade, for example, if you look at preferential trade agreements, they fall in the index, the euro index, actual trade flows, for example, or investment flow, how many, how much is actually being implemented, that's the de facto. And in some areas, this actually diverges. So there's more de facto trade, for example, that de facto trade continues to increase, but for example, then I'm actually not sure that that's true, but like you can see that on some measures it's increasing, but it's stagnating on the de euro or the other way around, right? So that's the distinction. The euro is really sort of the treaties on which globalization is based. Uh, for example, also with the socio-cultural, I think it's also sort of the number of embassies or something that, that's actually there, where there's actually diplomatic relations established and these kind of things, right? So it's really a an actual um, sort of treaty-based thing, and the de facto is the factors that bilateral tourist vis visits or something or phone like international phone calls or something like really stuff that's happening so that's it the, the the role of law in globalization i think that's a, a really good question i mean for me as a political scientist law is is like it's an international institution right it's any rule is, is sort of it's an international institution that that allows countries to cooperate more closely um, but any international institution in, in also has distributive consequences and it creates winners and losers. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, it always, I mean, I think one of the ideas of international cooperation is that we all benefit, but sort of how these benefits are distributed, it's usually not equal. Some get a bigger share of the pie. If you think of the UN Security Council, for example, I mean, there are some countries that just have more power, right? And a veto. And we can see that it has actual consequences. So um, in that sense, I think international law uh, is there to enable globalization, to structure globalization. It also distributes the gains from globalization, right? Um, and I, I, I think in that sense, it's, it plays a really important role. Um, we also see that some, I mean, some international institutions are also contested. What does it actually mean? Like, what kind of sanctions can we now actually impose and so on? Or in Switzerland right now, we have a big discussion. What actually does neutrality mean? Like, should we have followed those sanctions or not? And so on, right? So, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting discussions um, going on. Um, I think it's also no, normal that there's variation that some projects proceed more quickly than others. Um, also with, with the, um, with the uh, you know, so, some international treaties, also, for example, the Montreal Protocol on reducing the, uh, what's it called? Um, the substances that deplete the ozone layer. Yeah, the, the ozone. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was easier to do this. There were less. It was less distributional conflict because there were also technological um, uh, progress that made it easier for firms to to substitute and so on. Climate change has huge distributional consequences, right? Also, those who carry most of the burden of climate change um, are not really the main. They're not really the countries that have contributed most to it now um, and so on. So, I mean, there's huge conflicts about who pays how much and so on. Right? And, and that, of course, always makes it much more difficult to come to um, conclusions. Um, but I, I, I really think that one of the core things is that international cooperation, except for coercion, I mean, you can also force countries to participate, but beyond coercion, I think compromise is really key. You need to, everybody needs to get a little, everybody also needs to give a little, right? So that's why sort of these ideas, we can have it all and the things we don't like, we can just leave at the wayside, but that, that doesn't work because those may actually be important things for who got other countries on board. Um, so, so then um, I think sort of this feeds into your last question on sort of this, I would probably phrase it differently. I would sort of say that it's sort of this, the tension between national sovereignty and the benefits of international cooperation, right? And sort of how to make sure that sort of the compromise that you need to make on the international level are still somehow rooted in national politics and sort of 
gain the legitimate, like have have domestic legitimacy, right? And I think there's different ways that, uh, the, that organizations do that. The problem is if you put every single thing to a vote all the time, it's really hard to generate functioning, stable uh, international cooperation because you don't know how long it will actually um, last. I'll give you an example. So Switzerland is part of the Schengen regime, which means that we, we I mean, we signed up to just following all the Schengen rules, and, and that's actually, I mean, it makes it easy because it's, um, then you don't have to revisit this all the time. Now, but we have a referendum uh, thing, right? And um, so twice already, uh, Switzerland has decided, oh, wait a second, let's vote on whether we actually want to do this. We did this two years ago, we're going to do this again this May. And if we vote that we don't want to increase funding for Frontex in May, then we'll automatically fall out of Schengen. So, I mean, that creates a lot of uncertainty and, and this would have huge ripple effects. I mean, I just remember how just the airport was rebuilt to actually you know, have these Schengen entries and non-Schengen. And if Switzerland suddenly falls out, we're all non-Schengen. And um, so, I mean, if, if you question this all the time over and over again, this really puts uh, sand in the wheels of international effectiveness. So I think there's a trade-off between effectiveness and rooting these things in a referendum. At the same time, if you do hold the referendum and it's actually then supported, it gives the whole distinction a, a lot of legitimacy, right? So I think there's there's a trade-off between efficiency and, and, and national legitimacy. Um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense that some things are delegated and there needs to be a, like a democratic process that decides we want to delegate and it should be a good discussion. It also shouldn't be hidden on what these things imply. I don't think that for every little thing you can always have a domestic discussion. It's just, I mean, and in every country then nothing really moves forward anymore. Right? You also create a lot of entry points for lobby groups and so on. But I think it's a real, it's a real issue. And I think it's one that needs to be discussed. And, and I think this trade-off needs to be acknowledged, right? I mean, I think it's also a problem when countries say, well, you know, I mean, you shouldn't, I mean, it's not a problem, it's just the way it is. No, it's a problem. It's it's I mean, it's a we 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 are losing out on national sovereignty. We're getting something in return, and we as a society need to make the choice on whether we think that's worth it or not. Uh, I think I think that's the that's the key, and I think it's a trade off that's there. It's a dilemma that's there, and the nature of that is that you cannot have both, and you would like to have both, but you cannot. And I think it's it, the, the important thing is that on the societal level, we need to discuss about openly about this trade off and make a choice. But it's also sometimes in these debates, and it's, it's sort of the you can have national sovereignty without any of the of the downside, and that's also not the case, right? But I think that we need to have both sides and then decide on what we actually want. So to jump in, I know that Ming has also asked a question, yeah. but one of the interesting other facets of that sort of dilemma between efficiency and democratic legitimacy is the rise of these intra-parliamentary assemblies in these international organizations, I thought, which was a, a really interesting way to lift it up. So instead of Peter is right that I think that we're still executive led when it comes to foreign affairs. And so there is a little bit of, of an anachronism, I think there, no? I think having, having devised these constitutions in the 19th century, maybe in the 20th century, uh, where foreign affairs was something that was belongs to the executive. Whereas, you know, now most of these um, collective solutions need some sort of collaboration and cooperation, as you said. So maybe national constitutions aren't fit for purpose for globalization in that <laughs> sense. But I thought that the, the interesting way out of this is what you suggested, that you re-democratize international cooperation itself. And I thought that this was an interesting in, interesting alternative. Sorry, Peter, I just wanted to make that, that little no, but, I mean, footnote. I, I I think that's it's a really interesting question. How can you get out of that dilemma? But it's also not always easy. So some people say we should just have referendums in, in Europe right? and then just have popular legitimacy. But imagine that we vote on something uh, and a majority of countries and a majority of Europeans votes for something, say complete free movement of people or something. Right? But there's one country where 90% of the people vote against it. They would still have to implement the whole thing because, of course, all of Europe has democratically decided to do that. But you can imagine that that would really create a lot of grievances, right? So I think that so I, I personally think that sort of having referendums on the EU level would be 
I mean, that would be a spaltpilz, I think, for Europe rather than a unifying <laughs> thing because... Um, but it doesn't have to be a referendum, no? Yeah. It could be just parliamentary involvement. It doesn't yeah, have so to be... Yeah, so parliamentary involvement, I think that's, that I think is a much better way to go because I think there's also more, there's less emotion and so on, also more time to reflect more expertise also. But I think the referendums really create a lot and also a lot of opportunities for political entrepreneurs. Um, I, and I think it's a that's a really problematic thing as long, especially for like a as long as people don't have one demos, right? I mean, I think once once there's sort of disagreement on on who actually belongs, then yeah, yeah maybe maybe if I can just come in here. So I, I didn't want to um, advocate for referendums. In fact, quite the opposite. I mean, it's it's very specific and it's it's a good experience in 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 um, Switzerland, but I think it wasn't certainly the case in Germany. So after the Weimar Constitution, I mean, I, I wouldn't really um, advocate for that in 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 most uh, states. Uh, but I think it's more about treaty design. So since you mentioned the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete um, the ozone layer, I mean, there in Article 2.9, there's a mechanism that allows even by a qualified majority vote to tighten um, the protocol's mechanisms on phasing out and then phasing down, um, phasing down and phasing out the substances. So I think that is maybe the more honest way of um, designing a treaty that then allows for this kind of action instead of um, having a treaty that would normally call for a protocol approach still, but then not doing that, but instead allowing parties to, to tighten rules. And um, I, I absolutely understand this argument that it might be speedier for changing the regime, but I don't think it will be effective because sometimes then at the national level, level there will be not the the implementation possible in many states to follow through with the commitments. And then we've got this mismatch uh, between the international legal order and the national legal order. And that I think has a huge uh, delegitimizing potential for at, at all levels of law really, where we see what we've got one galloping ahead and the other is just stagnating. Um, and, and I think that this may be one of the reasons where the law could really contribute mm -hmm. through the way it's been made to this backlash on, on globalization. But I'm very aware that I'm talking and, and, and a colleague of, of ours here has um, asked a question. Can I read it out? I'm not sure, maybe it doesn't work with this speaking up. Um, I will read it out. So it's um, uh, Professor Ming asks, could you speak a bit more um, on the effects of uh, Russia-Ukraine war on the future of globalization? For example, when China sees what happened to Russia, won't China be more determined to create an alternative international economic order. We used to say that globalization contributes to world peace, it does, but isn't the success of globalization um, that it creates a force to push back globalization precisely because it constrains states so heavily? Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a, it's a difficult and really important question at the same time, right? I mean, I think it's a bit early to sort of say on what the, the Russia-Ukraine war will actually do, but I think we have some indications. And it's also, of course, not the first time that, that sanctions have been imposed and so on. So, I mean, with the Iran uh, sanctions already, I think it became very clear that the U.S. still has a lot of leverage over the financial system, for example. And China, I think, is sort of quite aware of these um, of these risks and you can also see even Russia had, I think, tried to um, create some workarounds. I don't think they expected the sanctions to be as comprehensive as they are now. And I think what uh, what the sanctions right now also show is that how much the, the West and especially the US still control sort of central nodes and how, you know, I mean, if you if you just forbid, for example, dollar transactions, that still it still has implications on many, many other things. Um, so I think that China will be very closely watching. And I think one of the big risks is indeed that this will lead to sort of a sort of two, two economic spheres um, kind of thing. And we do know from a lot of research that um, economic transactions increase the chance for peace. I mean, it's not, it's not a guarantee that we'll have peace. We see that now, right? Um, but just like increasing the, the, the costs of disrupting well working economic ties has a deterrent effect on war on the, at the margin right so in that sense i think it would be um, it would be better if the the, the west and china uh, remained closely connected but of course then they become also more um, 
vulnerable to each other. And I think there, there will be certainly some moves to try to disentangle the whole thing. I think one interesting thing is also how China's positioning itself with regard to, to Russia. Um, China, I think for sure, sees Russia as the junior partner, not the senior partner. And I think um, that also is an uneasy alliance. Um, I think one interesting question with China right now is also whether China will use this as a chance to sort of create this two spheres of influence or whether China uses this as a chance to sort of mend relations with the US a little bit and sort of try to you know, ease the tensions that emerged in the last couple of years a little bit. Um, I think right now it's, it's still early to say. Um, I mean, I, I think at least China hasn't sort of jumped to Russia's uh, rescue and, and that, that I, I think in this, in this scenario is a little bit uh, encouraging that we don't really see sort of a bifurcation, two big blocks suddenly facing each other. So if we want to talk about some good news uh, these days, I think sort of that the fact that they are trying to keep like, like not escalate the conflict even further is, is good news. Uh, to the extent on whether sort of uh, globalization itself sort of creates the, um, the seeds of its own destruction uh, to some extent. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that, that's sort of the reinforcing factors that I was trying to talk about. I think there are some dynamics that make it hard to sort of sustain this. Uh, I think sort of this idea, the idea that we are, you know, once you have high levels of interactions, it can never go back. I think that's flawed. We see, I mean, we only in the 1990s did we reach the same levels of globalization that the world had seen before the First World War. I mean, that gives you a sense of how, just how connected the world was before the First World War. And nonetheless, we saw a horrible, horrible war erupt, right? So, I mean, there's no guarantee that just because you trade, there's not going to be war, and we see that now. Um, but um, I mean, I think the question is also still, what is the alternative? And I think sometimes that gets lost in, in the discourse because, and I think oftentimes also nationalist discourse often goes as follows, let's get rid of the constraints of globalization, but continue to enjoy the benefits. This was very visible, for example, in the Brexit discourse, right? Let's get out of the EU, but keep all the benefits from, from EU membership. Um, and it's, it's the same, exactly the same discourse, by the way, in Switzerland about, you know, let's like, stay away from the EU, but keep all the benefits. And that of course does not work, right? So, but if you wanna get out, you need to think about what is an, a, the counterfactual world. And I think that's something that also needs to be pushed more than in political debate. Like what are our alternatives? What does the world look like if we don't have that? We, I mean, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say, I don't like this. I don't think this is good. You know, we wanna have more sovereignty, but then we need to so just openly discuss on what, what does the world then look like? And are we willing to pay that price or not? But yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 not a those are not easy questions for sure. Thank you very much. Um, I can see Kiriaki's hand. I have a very boring question. After all, this excitement, which is most important, talking about war and so on. But um, you know, when you were saying about perhaps we have a more EU centric view of attitudes towards international cooperation, globalization, or, or perhaps the West and so on. I was thinking that also in your presentation, you told us we don't have much information on where how people feel about globalization, right? You said there was only this one survey, international survey with three data points, or why, why we don't, I mean, if it's an important issue, it's more politicized, about international cooperation and so on. Why there's so little availability of information? And why don't we ask people enough? Is it because we don't want to know the answer, perhaps? Like <laughs> no, so I, I, I think I, uh, I, um, I didn't express myself clearly. I, I, we, we now have lots of studies in many countries. I mean, there's surveys also have become much, much cheaper. So we, we have a lot of surveys. What we don't really have, and I think that speaks to the fact that globalization wasn't so politicized 40 years ago, what we don't have is data that goes back 40, 50 years. So surveys from the 1950s, what people thought about globalization and trade there, we hardly, we don't really have that. And especially not for many countries asking the same question at the same time. So, so if you wanna know today what people think about globalization, there's tons of data. But what I was interested in and seeing has there, has there been changes over time in many countries. And then it becomes much more limited. There's of course some surveys in the EU, but even they started in the 1990s, 2000s. Um, but really going back for many countries, there's very, very little research. And I think it's related to the fact that it just wasn't a big issue in, in the 70s and so on. So 
running surveys at that point in time was also super expensive, right? So you really had to think about what you wanted to ask people. And people just didn't think that trade was like the thing to talk about or international organization. And I think that's exactly, you know, um, that shows that that, that that it was not so politicized as it is today. Today, of course, we ask about these things and we have a lot of surveys. And I think the point that Robert was making before, I think is a good one. We actually also do have surveys from the global south, but many, many studies really just focus on the West. And I think we need to have much more surveys that ask the same question all over and then really also look at these things. There are, I should say, a lot of studies that look at sort of who supports trade and who doesn't also in the global South. But it's not so much on sort of the backlash that comes out of this, right? So, I mean, we know who wants it or not, but is, is trade actually a salient issue for these people or not? That we know much less about. Thank you very much. And uh, I shouldn't hide. So uh, Ming also says, thank you very much. Very informative talk. So lots of positive comments here. <laughs> Just reading that out as well. Um, are there any other questions? That there are plenty on my side, yeah, but I'm no, not no. sure we should, <laughs> we should uh, ask you for, sure for, you for much more for, of your time, Stephanie. But um, um, thank you very much for, for my side. I really, I mean, there, there's lots of really interesting food for thought. I, I did have a question on the spot, you, what the structural changes are, but maybe we can do this um, uh, afterwards. I, I think we should probably call it a, a day. I think it's, um, it's almost an hour and a half. Okay, so I think that's a good word to finish it then. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, on behalf of all of us from the Global Policy Institute. It was a wonderful talk, really enjoyable. Um, yeah, one hour and a half, great discussion as well. So much more to follow up, I hope. So I hope we can continue this conversation. And thank you again so much. Very insightful talk and absolutely brilliant. Thank you. And a warm applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. I, I thought the questions were great. It's always great to also start thinking about new things as well, right? And, and I enjoyed that very much. So thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Hopefully Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Lovely Thank to you. see you. Lovely to see you too. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody else. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> then we can put